So hello everyone, uh, welcome to the University of Michigan Physics Department Colloquium. I'm Roy Clark, uh, I'll be the faculty host for today's proceedings. Today we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Dr. Willie Hubbs Moore's graduation from the University of Michigan Physics Department, where she became the first black woman in America to earn a PhD in physics. Uh, given the uh, importance of this event, I want to first introduce uh, Dr. Moore's daughter, Dorian, and I'd like to uh, have a uh, very warm Michigan welcome. For Now I'd like to call on uh, my colleague uh, Herb Winfall, who is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at the University of Michigan. And uh, Herb, uh, to all of our benefit, has been a mainstay in our applied physics program here at the University of Michigan. And uh, I'm now going to call on Herb to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Donnell Walton. <coughs> Thank you, Roy. And I'd like to welcome Dorian and all of you to this incredible event. So, in addition to being the first African American woman to earn a PhD in physics, and she did it right here at U of M, uh, Dr. Moore was also the first African American woman to earn bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan. So she was making history all along. So to help us properly celebrate Dr. Willie Hobbs Moore, it is my great pleasure to introduce another very special person who actually knew Dr. Moore. Dr. Donald Walton did his undergraduate studies at North Carolina State University, graduating summa cum laude with a double major in electrical engineering and physics. As if double majoring in these tough disciplines was not hard enough, Donnell also found time to play college football. After that, he came to Michigan to do his PhD in applied physics. Now, I've been here on the EECS faculty for 36 years, and I can say that one of the best things that happened to me was Donald Walton selecting me to be his thesis advisor. In addition to being incredibly smart and creative, Donnell was and still is the most well-read person I know. He reads everything from philosophy to political science, from great literature to quantum science, and he can discourse at length on any topic. So we did some theoretical work on a new kind of mode locking in fiber lasers, and then he carried out experiments at the Center for Ultrafast Optical Science in the lab of our Nobel laureate, Gerard Mourou. As someone who cares deeply about community, he also made time to volunteer with organizations like the African American Academy of Ann Arbor and the Detroit Area Pre-College Engineering Program. After his PhD, he decided to make an impact at an HBCU. So he joined the physics faculty at Howard University and set up a very nice fiber laser research lab and won an NSF career award. Two years later, he moved to Corning Research Lab. At Corning, he established the company as a world leader in high power kilowatt level fiber lasers and then became the manager of worldwide applications of uh, Gorilla Glass. Helping grow revenue from 20 million to over a billion, 
In 2016, he was appointed director of the Corning West Technology Center in Sunnyvale, California, where he leads research and business opportunities in the Silicon Valley region. Last year, he was awarded the ECE Willie Hobbs Moore Distinguished Alumni Lectureship. So please help me welcome our special Willie Hobbs Moore colloquium speaker, Dr. Donald Walton. Thank you, Herb. <laughs> Thanks, Herb. Thank you, Herb, for the generous introduction. I have to say it's a great opportunity to be here, especially after Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple quick things before I start. One is I'd like to thank Dorian for coming again. It's, it's wonderful to be here. I was worried that I'll get some of the physics wrong and people will give me a hard time. Now you're being here. When I get the history wrong, you'll be able to correct me on that too. <laughs> Two, uh, my daughter, who's teaching down in Baton Rouge, just told me that she's tuned in on YouTube, so I want to say hi to her. And three, um, Herb mentioned that I, was, I started off at, um, at Howard. And a brief non sequitur before I get started. Um, when I was there, the two assistant provosts, one of his name was Don Coleman, the other one was O. Jackson Cole. They were both Michigan alums, and they were very... Um, uh, con they contributed greatly to my uh, uh, formative years, about three and a half years I was at Howard. And it, it was just really amazing to be out in the world and still have the guidance of, uh, of, of Wolverine. So, and I'll actually come back to that a little bit later. So as, uh, let's see if I can get this guy to, to work. There we go. So w this was the working title of my presentation when Roy invited me to present. I said I would got, like to give some reflections on uh, Dr. Hobbs Moore, her, uh, her, her life, and actually talk a little bit about her science. And then after I started pulling it together, I, uh, okay, let's see, oh, there we go. This, okay, I'm going to be st stuck here, I guess. Oh, let's see what happened. Here. After I actually started pulling it together, I realized that the real title is I'm going to talk about her life, her Lagrangians, her loss functions, and a little bit about her legacy. So the scope of my presentation will be, I'll give a few biographical highlights, but I'll focus primarily on her uh, professional biographical highlights, not her personal ones. I'll say a little bit about her personal ones. I'll give a brief overview of the research that she conducted while she was at the University of Michigan. Again, this stemmed from the last time I was here, uh, June. Herb asked about her research. I said, you know what? I should probably learn a little bit about her research. So I've, I've, I've since studied that. And, and I will also talk about some of, specifically some of the work that she did after she left University of Michigan, her, um, her, her postgraduate work at Michigan, and she went to Ford. And then I'll kind of close with some personal reflections. So I'll start with the life. So interestingly enough, in 1954, and this is a, kind of an iconic picture. That was the year that Brown v. Board was, uh, was won at the Supreme Court. So this is just a, uh, an iconic picture I got from the internet. Uh, Nettie Hunt and her daughter sitting on the, Supreme, uh, the steps of the Supreme Court to, to, to commemorate that, that, that victory. And that just turned out to be the same year that Willie Hobbs Moore came to the University of Michigan to study electrical engineering. And that was during a time where she came from Atlantic City, and it was during a time when intelligent black women, or black girls at that time, were uh, directed to become teachers or nurses, not, not engineers, not scientists. However, there was an alumnus that she encountered from the University of Michigan who told her about electrical engineering, and she decided at that point that was going to be her objective, regardless of being first generation of her family to go to college along with her two other younger sisters that, to follow in her footsteps, she decided that's what she was going to do. She hopped on a train and she came to University of Michigan intent on becoming an electrical engineer. And she did. As, as Herb mentioned in the introduction, she, she became the first uh, electrical engineering alumna in, in 1958. She earned her bachelor's of science degree in electrical engineering. And a few years later, in 61, she earned her master's degree. And then she went on to take several jobs in these fields, the first of which was at the Bendix Aerospace Systems. 
here in Ann Arbor. She started there after her master's. Then she went to Stratford, Connecticut to work at Barnes Engineering. Then she, uh, and there she did some IR um, calculations, but most of the work, all of the work that uh, Dr. Hobbs-Moore did was uh, theoretical work, uh, modeling work, phenomenology. Then she came back to Ann Arbor and worked for a company called Sensor Dynamics, which I'll bring up again a little bit later. After Sensor Dynamics, she came to work at the University of Michigan and the Institute of Science and Technology. And there she did some uh, hypersonic uh, modeling of hypersonic wakes. Uh, 67, she worked at KMS, KMS Fusion, uh, mainly on computational optics, and, uh, magnetohydrodynamics. In 69, she worked at Datamax. And w during those last two positions, uh, she uh, entered the PhD program at the University of Michigan in physics. Uh, she worked with Sam Krim on uh, calculating vibrational modes of molecules with secondary chlorides. And as I start to try to piece this together, um, in 68, uh, the Macromolecular Research Center was formed here at University of Michigan. So we had a, uh, a, an IBM 360 machine, you know, supercomputer that's almost as powerful as uh, your Apple Watch now. But in spite of that, great, great, great work. And, and again, I was talking with Roy about this earlier, just another history of kind of the inner and multidisciplinarity of University of Michigan. Um, it had 26 faculty, eight different departments from four different colleges. So this was kind of the uh, environment in which she uh, came after kind of honing her skills at the different uh, engineering positions. Again, electrical engineering coming over to physics. So physics, I'll talk about her. Lagrangians. So she worked on uh, polyvinyl chlorides ultimately, but and in, 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 in specifically secondary chlorides and secondary chlorides. I, I borrowed this uh, diagram to show these up. The, the, the number of the chloride is how many carbon molecules are, um, the carbon molecules that the chloride is attached to, how many chlorides. So primary would be just one carbon molecule, as indicated here. Let me see if I can get this guy to work. You working? There it is. Yeah, here she is. Yeah, so this one, so it's just attached to one. The secondary chloride, right? So this carbon is attached to two others, and it's tertiary, right? This carbon is attached to one, two, three others. So she's trying to understand these, and, 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 and ultimately in uh, PVC. But, but initially, um, again, this is the uh, late 60s. We don't have uh, the advantages of uh, GPT-3, right? So she, as I look at and as I kind of describe the work that she did, she was like a, 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 an actual, with, a, with an IBM 360 slash 67, a, uh, she trained her, um, the model that she created on these smaller chloride um, uh, molecules, chloride containing uh, molecules, and then uh, went on to extend that to the much more complex PVC, and we'll kind of walk through that. So the, the first two molecules that she looked at, and these were kind of more well known to test the uh, force fields and the potential wells that she came up with, to, and I'll show those of the Lagrangians, were this kind of two uh, chloropropane and this two chlorobutane. So these are kind of the first ones that she um, started doing these calculations, primarily on vibrational calculations, so looking at Raman and infrared, and then uh, using a least squares fit to the known lines to those. And this is all classical, right? So, so there's, there's no quantum mechanical calculation. So this is all, uh, <laughs> as it, it's, I'll, I'll just show a few equations, but everyone, almost everyone's here is familiar with this is, uh, the, the main thing I got a chance to do as I kind of read through her thesis was to re-acclimate myself to chapter six of Goldstein, if you guys are interested in oscillations. <laughs> um, I actually, it was acclimating. I, I realized as I was doing this, I didn't, I don't think I understood it the first time. So, um, so again, since it's classical, she's not able to, uh, to, to look at these kind of change in the, the dipole so, or the, the infrared active or, you know, the, the Raman activity comes from the change in the polarizability. Uh, the, the, in, in addition to the computing power, she's able to use every physicist's uh, favorite symmetry uh, to, to, to try to look at, at as these uh, molecules became more and more complex to eliminate some of the uh, condi conditions, which I'll show by symmetry arguments and, and, and group theory. 
And the, the good thing is about because the uh, electron orbitals are so, you know, I won't say hyper-localized, but very localized, the force constants that she was able to uh, calculate and then fit to the smaller molecules I just showed would then be uh, applicable to the, the, the larger, more complex molecules in her thesis work. And then going on, skipping ahead into the future, some of the protein work that she did uh, later as a research scientist at Michigan. So, chapter six of Goldstein. So the first is that she took, took those, you know, these, these atoms or these, these nuclei that we looked at in the, the, the electronic, well, I'll, I'll say orbitals, but again, it's not, not quantum, the electrons, and just reduce that back down to a normal, normal mode analysis, right? So, so, so by doing that, we can get, um, if we have K molecules or, 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 or K atoms, the uh, T is the kinetic energy, and we can just, we can look at that as in the three directions, X, Y, and Z, and uh, where the mass is the mass of the, that, that, the ith ion, the, uh, these kind of delta parameters here are the displacements from equal, so again, this is a normal mode analysis of the uh, kinetic energy. And we think about the potential energy, we can actually work that out in normal mode analysis as well. And after we write all these things out, again, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, Goldstein, we can make some arbitrary uh, determinations, like we can make, we can just say that the baseline potential, V0, is, is, we can set that equal to zero. And then we can also say the cross terms, uh, we can say that the equilibrium potential energy is a minimum, so that can take all of our first derivatives to zero, so that second term goes to zero. So then we're just left with the, the cross terms at the bottom. And the high order terms, again, we're looking at the limit of very small um, vibration, very small perturbations, so all of our higher terms are gone. We can assume they're gone. So if that's the case, then we can look at the potential energy as this, this first summation over 3K because we have uh, three dimensional space, so we have three, de three degrees of freedom. And the, the F sub i j here is, uh, is, is how, what's the best way to say this? Well, well it'll, it'll make more sense in the, in, the, in, the next, in the next page, I believe. But, but we we're just actually looking at the potential here. And the, the main thing here is that the, the F sub i j's are these coefficients through the uh, least squares analysis that we're actually going to solve for. Right. So if we look at this normalized coordinate system, they are only functions that's normalized of the velocities and the displacements. So the, uh, the t's are all just, just functions of the velocities, the first derivative. And then doing that, and then setting the uh, q, that's, this is the cross terms that I was showing earlier. What? Moving that for me. Yeah, so, so we can actually look at the, we, we see that it's just a simple harmonic oscillator, right? So we can get this final equation for each of the normal modes, and we have for, for um, three times the number of uh, molecules, or number of atoms in each one, equations to solve, and that's where the actual computer comes in. So, and just a reminder of what are we solving for. So these are looking at the atoms in uh, Cartesian coordinate space, so these are figures from the actual thesis. Um, so you can see that the first one's in the uh, XZ plane is just showing the location of, say, one of the atoms uh, that, we're, that we're looking at. So and from this, most importantly, we can, and, uh, we can look at all of them so we can see the atoms. So we can look at the translation. Well, I think the next slide will show. Yeah, the translation, uh, uh, the translation of, uh, along each one, the bending, and then also the torsional. So these are the degrees of freedom that we're solving for, for the known atoms initially, and then we'll come back and then fit those potentials um, to the known spectra. So what, 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 so what, what, what happens? We have some known spectra that have been measured, be it, uh, be it infrared or Raman. So we have some lines there. Um, the literature has already stated some propositions of what uh, modes they, they, they correspond to for the smaller molecules and then she'll go on to extend those force fields to the uh, um, polyvinyl uh, chloride. So, and, and so the, the challenge here, so again, classical mechanics, it can be deceptively uh, <laughs> hairy. 
the, 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 the challenge here is that we know that the, uh, the number of force constants we need as we're thinking about an entire uh, class or, or species of, of isomers can be mi um, many more than, so it's, a, it's an underdetermined system. We have many more force constants than the number of observed frequencies. So we're going to be limited just by trying to match everything by the spectra that are the known spectra. And uh, the, the small perturbations of the uh, vibrations are not the only source of these frequencies. They, they can have anharmonicities, and they can also have resonances, in, in, in depending on the uh, atomic uh, species. So because of this, we have to study multiple molecules to get force fields that would have the same constants. And we will also um, look at data from different um, stereosmers, or so different uh, confirmations of the same molecule, and also doing different species. So we can do whatever perturbation to, to get as many frequencies as we can force constants. All right, so we can, and, and I say, for example, uh, replacing some of the hydrogens with uh, deuterium. And um, the other one to, to kind of reduce this problem is something that's uh, tractable. <clears throat> Not just using Raman and, uh, and infrared, but also X-ray diffraction and also NMR was used to, 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 to uh, kind of confirm a lot of these measurements. Were, did you have all these capabilities in the lab? Yeah, so I, I knew the infrared Raman, so XRD. The XRD and, was in different buildings, but yeah. Close enough. Again. Multidisciplinary, right? It's 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 a key. So it's great. That's another reason why it's great to be at this uh, at at U of M. So the first thing is uh, to take those 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 two those molecules that we showed earlier, the chlorobutane, and to get those force constants, and then to go to a slightly more complex uh, um, uh, um, polymer. This is the kind of the trichloroheptane. Uh, and then we were able to, so this is, I, I made this analogy to uh, machine learning. So the other ones were, you can kind of think of those as a training set, get, get the, the fitting parameters and then actually extend that one to, to this new, um, slightly more complex uh, um, um, structure. And then we we're able to get structural information that we need on PVC is gonna be a lot more complex. So now I'll actually show the kind of the, 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 the results. If, I know that's small, but this is extremely cool because the first column are the frequencies that were known either from literature or measured in the, in the lab locally. And these the, the second two rows or columns are the calcu the, the, her calculations. Um, and the, the TTT and the TTGG are just two confirmations of that uh, molecule on the, on the preceding chapter. And just looking at, just, we're looking at just a few percentage uh, difference between what's measured and what is actual calculated. So it's amazing stuff. And I think about, um, again, working with a computer that's not as powerful as, as a watch today, and uh, you know, being, be, being a family person at this time. It is, it's hard, hard enough to focus you know, if it's just the science, right? And then after kind of showing that, she went ahead and extended to the actual topic of her thesis, which was looking at these uh, uh, the force constants that she determined on the, the prior smaller complexes and to extend that to uh, polyvinyl chloride. And once again, just uh, looking at these, uh, the observed frequencies and the calculated frequencies, just, you know, we're, we're talking about single digit percentage differences and uh, amazing stuff. So, so uh, looking at symmetries, assuming uh, what, what these, modes, these normal modes correspond to, be they torsional, be they bending, uh, be they just, just, in, it just in plane, and being able to make these determinations and uh, calculations with it, to, uh, to coordinate, it's just it's fascinating to me. Um, the other aspect of it was, um, one of the contributions of her thesis was, there was a torsional mode um, in the, the uh, PVC that had not been uh, hypothesized before, mainly because it was, I, I, I truncated this, there, there are pages and pages of, of, of these, uh, these, um, these frequency uh, uh, pairs, but there are some very small, uh, the, the torsional ones, as you can imagine, are, you know, very low, very low energy, and there, there's, NMR was actually used to, course, uh, to corroborate those, but she was able to uh, 
uniquely identify some torsional modes in PVC that had not been seen before. So very interesting stuff. PhD thesis, and then um, the macromolecular um, facility started moving into uh, biophysics. And, and her, uh, so she and uh, Sam Krim spent five years after her thesis um, extending this work from the complexities of polychloride to working on peptides, polypeptides, and proteins. So much more complex, many more um, uh, degrees of freedom, um, uh, assumptions that had to be determined by using multi, multiple uh, modalities of measurements. And even with this work, uh, I picked one of her, her papers uh, with the, again, the, the computational ability of the air. She's, I mean, th this stuff is even closer. I mean, most of these are like dead on, right? If you look at the, um, I think that this silly uh, pointer has more computational power than she was using. But um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're dead on here. So her models got increasingly more complex and increasingly more precise and, and from this, even more accurate. So very, very nice stuff. So this was five years looking at more, and, and, the, and even these uh, proteins today are still used as model proteins. So, you know, AlphaFold, is, is used for this today, right, to, to actually look at it. But this is looking at different, and predicting different conformations um, based on first principles, classical mechanics. Um, and that was, yeah, so that was her, uh, the PVC was her PhD dissertation, and then the, the protein work was five years as a lecturer and a research scientist here at Michigan. And then she went over to Ford from, uh, from Michigan, and then I'll talk about uh, loss function. Any questions or comments um, so far? Cause I, I, I want to kind of speed through this, because the, the point is that it was cool stuff, um, and it's just classical mechanics, which I think is an interesting, uh, I won't say diversion, but a, an interesting departure from being an electrical engineer and then coming in and, and jumping right into uh, classical like that, and, uh, small oscillations. So the work um, that she did, um, I think, really is kind of phenomenology. And then she kind of extended, uh, you know, looking at first principles in phenomenology, looking at just kind of these core things to understand how very, very complex systems work. And that ended up translating uh, very well to Ford, specifically in quantifying quality. So this was the uh, late 70s where um, you know, the big three or however many uh, U.S. companies we had there, we were, we were falling behind uh, the Japanese as far as manufacturing of, uh, in the automotive industry, primarily because of the Toyota production system, right? And uh, Taguchi methods, they were making higher quality cars than we were at the time, right? So the Taguchi principles are the primarily ones that kind of are, are fourfold. And, and this comes from a... a, a what was a canonical book in, in quality that uh, she was a co-author on? The principles were cost is more, a more important element for any product. It's the most important element, even as a consumer it is, right? Cost is the most important element. Cost cannot be reduced without any influences on quality, right? You just can't just arbitrarily say, I'm going to start charging you two cents for this instead of five cents without some impact. It has to, um, quality can be improved without improving the cost. And this can be achieved by the utilization of interactions with noise. So how can you, so this is basically improving your processes. And the last one is cost can be reduced through any quality improvement, right? If I can actually, it's the elimination of waste. So these are kind of principles, very qualitative principles. Or kind of a, the, how much it costs to produce something is how much it costs the raw materials how, to, to process it, to control that process and something that's becoming even more important now as we become more aware of sustainability, how, what, what is the environmental impact on this, right? And the controls are how much it costs to control the production, the equipment of the production or, or everything in those and that, and also how much it, does it cost to control the quality. So these are, again, very qualitative, even though I have a, a, a quasi-equation there. Her contribution 
to this was to recast quality, this thing that's somewhat arbitrary, especially outside of a factory, from focus on, you know, kind of defect or approval rate, when you guys have had, you know, P's and Q's in a, in quality control, and, and, and start using what's called loss functions. And what this really did was operationalize uh, statistical process control to show no one's really going to talk about, you know, how good something is, how do you quantify this, but everyone knows how much something costs. So she was able to literally convert do, using the same rigorous quantification process. Um, these, these things, so this, this is a loss function where, where A is the, the cost of whatever part it is you're doing, whatever process you're doing. The, the delta is the tolerance on that product of that, of that, of that uh, what, what you're making, how, you know, plus or minus, whatever. And then the, uh, the, 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 the sigma squared is a deviation, how far it is from the actual target. And since A is in dollars and those, those, those squared things, L is in dollars. So what she was able to do is actually show that if this part or this process was this far out of control, it will cost you this amount of money. And this was, this changed the hegemony in the U.S. auto industry basically to start Executives can understand that. They don't care about sigma squared and delta squared. They care about dollars to, to the first power, right? So being able to translate that um, was able to not only change how the um, Ford and the auto industry did production, but they, they also started doing similar um, or analogous processes even in R&D. And we even use some of these kinds of things now, thinking about what is the impact of this and being able to quantify that in dollars. It's, it, it's, a, it's a, this, you know, I actually, the, the most important about, uh, thing about this slide is that I put that on that there at the bottom part so that actually showed that it, uh, it impacted the bottom line. But that's a visual pun there for everyone to make sure you're awake. But yeah, so, so this was uh, extremely important work. Um, helped the United States kind of reclaim competitiveness and, and uh, not just automotive but um, uh, manufacturing back when, remember when we made stuff back in the United States? And also um, went beyond that to even impact the uh, um, other um, areas of industry including research and development. So I would kind of um, think about, if I think about uh, Willie has more kind of impact, I think about this quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes for the simplicity on this side of complexity, I wouldn't give you a fig, but for the simplicity on the other side of complexity, I'll give you anything I have. That, and that kind of uh, encapsulates her contributions, right? It sums up her, her scientific approach to increasingly more complex um, scientific problems and then translating that to something that you can actually make a real impact on outside of the laboratory and, and, and something that had a bottom line financial impact on industry and uh, American competitiveness. So that's kind of loss function. So I'll, I'll kind of start wrapping up by talking a little bit about legacy. So, so as Herbert mentioned, um, um, uh, Willie Hasmore and, and, and I, we both worked at the uh, Saturday African American Academy um, at Clegg Middle School. And as a matter of fact, that's where we met uh, after I became aware of uh, that Willie Hasmore existed when I was a grad student uh, by Ron Mickens who uh, had come here to give a talk and he said that the, the first African-American woman to get a PhD was from Michigan and she actually lived in Ann Arbor. And it just so, so, so happened that she and I had been volunteering uh, um, for, you know, uh, at that time, probably about a year without having met. So I, I was able to meet her there doing something that, um, that we both cared a lot about. And this kind of spawned a friendship and um, we would kind of hang out a little bit after those uh, sessions and there were kind of three topics that we would discuss, kind of like uh, obviously this uh, STEM, the importance and how do you actually implement uh, STEM education for traditional underrepresented uh, people, the history of, of science and specifically uh, things, uh, African Americans in science, like I was saying, hey, no, we have to have more and she would actually give me the context that, well, believe it or not, University of Michigan and Princeton were the kind of top producers of African Americans and PhDs um, in the 50s and 60s in the United States. Numbers are still small, but um, you know, like Homer Neal, for example, came out of Michigan in 66 or so. And it, you know, she kind of made me aware of those things. 
And then the other one, just, just basically just research and this kind of this, this thing I mentioned is kind of how do you quantify uh, things that are um, complex and, and previously unquantifiable like these complex molecules, like uh, the cost of quality. And so one of the things I, I, I was tasked with was I, I, I was working with the National Conference of Black Physics Students and uh, Dr. Hobbs Moore had never really been a part of the African American physics community. So I was leading the conference in 95 and I invited her to attend and be the inaugural recipient of the Edward Boucher Award. Edward Boucher is the first African American to get a PhD in any field and it just so happened it was in physics in 1876. And this is uh, what we looked like back then in the, in the late 90s. Uh, a, a brief aside is the person, I'm, so I'm on my knee in case you can't figure out which one is me. And the person furthest from me is Beth Brown. Uh, Beth was another Michigan alum. She and I were contemporaries, and she was an astrophysicist. She, she passed on, uh, on untimely death as well. But, um, and, but she would uh, come to uh, uh, hang out with uh, uh, Dr., Dr. Moore and I, or maybe I, hang, I hung out with them sometimes as well. So I, I was happy to find this picture. And then so she was going to come to the 1995, but unfortunately um, uh, we lost Dr. Hobbs Moore in, in 94. So she was able to, or she received, she was offered this award posthumously. So that was 94. Ten years later, uh, Michigan um, honored her and uh, Elmer Imes, who was the second African American to get a PhD in physics, and, and he got it in the University of Michigan in 1918. Um, so in 2004, I was invited to give a talk about her and to basically just knowing her. And I, I didn't realize how, uh, how uh, um, I hadn't really processed her untimely passing at the time. So while I was presenting, I won't do it today, so you won't have that. I actually cr started to cry. The reason that's important is because my daughter was five years old and she had just discovered YouTube. And this was on YouTube. So one of the first things she saw on YouTube was, she said, Dad, I saw you on YouTube. You were crying. So, uh, but, but the real highlight of that day was that was the first time I was lucky enough to meet uh, Dr. Dorian Moore back here. And then, fast forward many years later, uh, to 20, 2021, Herb invited me to talk about Dr. Hobbs Moore's legacy um, at a Juneteenth event virtual, because it's 2021. Uh, Dorian was there, and she actually wrote in the uh, Zoom chat, hey, this is Dorian, I'm I really appreciate you guys uh, honoring my mother. And I wrote her back and said, hey, Doran, we should be in touch. You know, you know, here's my email. Crickets. She never responded. Didn't respond. That's important. And then James Mickens, who uh, got his uh, PhD here, he told his dad, Ron Mickens, that about this event. Ron was the person that first told me that uh, Dr. Willie Hosbor existed and then set me on a quest to find her. And because of that, Ron um, was writing a a paper for Physics Today that has since published, and he had some questions about uh, Willie that he didn't know the answers to, so he asked me, and I didn't know the answers to him, so I had to try to figure out how to do them, and he, and he asked me, why don't you contact Dorian? I said, ah, I'm not contacting her anymore. She, she don't respond to emails. So I eventually did contact her. We got in touch, and uh, we were able to uh, get the answers to the questions that he had, and then moreover, um, for the 50th anniversary. Ron also talked me into organizing the symposium at the uh, American Physical Society March meeting uh, this year to commemorate this 50th uh, anniversary and, and, uh, of, her, of, of, of black women having PhDs in physics. There are about 150 now. And those themes that we spoke about during our time together of, you know, kind of uh, history of African Americans, I had uh, Dr. Jamie Valentine, who's a PhD from uh, Johns Hopkins, and uh, she's a patent examiner. She spoke, and she's also the founder of the African American Women in Physics uh, organization, so she spoke about the history of black women in physics at this. Jercita Jones is a professor at NYU. She does lots of outstanding work that I didn't even know about before this in the community for black and brown students there in, in New York City, a lot of which she finances out of her own pocket. And Dr. Nadia Mason, who I'm sure has spoken at a uh, symposium here as a professor at University of Illinois, she spoke on her superconductivity research. And she was, uh, last year, I guess she was inducted into the, uh, as a fellow at American Physical Society. And this year, she was inducted to the uh, National Academy of Sciences. So just an outstanding uh, researcher. So 
this was a, this was a pretty well um, received symposium, again inspired uh, by uh, the, the 50th anniversary. So my second to last thought is, I mentioned earlier um, Don Coleman. One of the, when I was at Howard, he was the associate provost. But after I left, he went on to become the provost. When I when we did this symposium, I po I posted something about it on LinkedIn, and he responded. Um, that he remembered her, I didn't know that he even knew her, but he responded to my um, thing to saying that he remembered um, how she had tutored him when uh, she was a year or two ahead of him at, university, at electrical engineering, and how she tutored him, and the way she taught, she taught people was always first principles. She would, it would be like not that he, she was teaching you something, but she was reminding you of something she already knew. So that was just such an important thing because Don was independently kind of a mentor of mine when I was at Howard. I had no idea that he had been mentored by another mentor of mine, you know, decades earlier. Another person that I just found out about uh, this year, again, and, and kind of looking through these things, is Samuel Harmon. Samuel Harmon was a, a friend in, of, of Willie's back in the uh, 60s, and two of the companies that she had worked at, um, Sensor Dynamics and Datamax Corporation, he was, he, they, they were his company. He founded those companies. So she worked with, you know, so I, you know, never, never, never heard of this guy. He um, got his undergraduate at Wayne State, but he worked on his PhD, but I think he was ABD here at Electrical Engineering at, at uh, University of Michigan. So, th so the real point of that is that um, there's a wonderful uh, quote by Kenneth Manning, who's a historian of science, that says that, on the surface, a ray of light exhibits uniform makeup. But when viewed through a prism, light scatters into the many colors of the rainbow. Under the prism of analysis, the scientific community similarly reveals its heterogeneity. So a lot of these things, are like all these DEI things that we're thinking about now, um, we need to kind of recast them as uncovering things that have already happened and being a part of a long continuum that, that's it's nothing new. It's been going on. So I'll close with that thought. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, that's my, that's my background. Sorry about that, yeah. <laughs> this is the part where I'm supposed to say go blue, but I don't think I have to. You can't say it better than that. <laughs> Again, any questions or comments? Oh, thanks. Sorry, thanks. So, yeah, we have a few... <clears throat> Little time for some questions. Um, so please go ahead. Yeah, I'm curious, what was your work like at Clay Middle School? What kind of program was it? What were you doing with the students there? So I'll answer that question, but first I'll tell you um, how we met, she and I met. So the, the, the program, what it was, it was for um, elementary, or actually through, I think it was fifth through five through twelve. And it was, there were two components. One was a tutoring component, and one was actually a course room component. And I actually taught um, different math courses and a, and a science course where we actually took things apart um, and, and put them, tried to put them back together. And I met her because she primarily tutored. And when I first found out who she was, I walked over to her and I said, hey, I want to meet you. And she just put her hand up because she was, and she didn't even look at me in the eye. She was with another student. And then later that day when we were over, she came up to me, found me, and said, hey, I was in the, right on the verge of teaching this young lady in trigonometry how to prove congruent triangles with angle side angle. So it was primarily tutoring and then some actual uh, in-class in instruction. I have a quick question. <clears throat> no one else has a question? No, well, actually, this is more of a comment. Um, you know, we're standing here in, in the David Dennison Colloquium Hall. We're about to celebrate the, uh, the second uh, scientist, uh, black scientist to get a PhD in Michigan, Alma Irons, for the memorial in the spring. Um, he works with uh, Harrison Randall on. on very fundamental quantization and uh, rotational modes in, in uh, molecules, diatomic molecules. And then 
then um, you know, you fast forward through a whole spectacular range of spectroscopic discoveries, including spin and, and uh, including the work that you just described. So there's a long history here. And, and, and uh, uh, Edward Boucher measured uh, the, yeah. the first person he did uh, re refractive indices. So optics, optics is the future. Yeah. So, so for for us here at the University of Michigan, you know, this is really deep in our hearts. And when we teach uh, courses, we're teaching. You know, I I'm teaching a course now that that uh, has that diagram of an organic molecule, and they're looking at the round modes and figuring out you know, the similarity between the molecules. So it's, it's a kind of enduring spectroscopic um, tradition, and I, I saw it really clearly out of your, your talk, and thank you for doing that. I, I actually had a question. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, you know, large organizations, they have their own complexities, and you, you kind of indicated that there are similarities between very old established ones and, and newer ones. Uh, is, there, uh, is there a physicist's way of looking at that? Um, and uh, how is that going to be in the future? Ooh, so, <laughs> oh, no, no, that's a great question. Um, the answer is yes and no. It, it's a, so I, I'll tell you, so I got invited because of a, APS back page article I wrote, I've mentioned with Carl, Carl Wyman about education. And someone invited me to the April meeting of APS next year to talk about the, future, the, the culture of physics in the future. And I started piecing together some thoughts about how do we go beyond reductionism and ascription. And ascription is because we're scientists and we like one of the things that made Randall and Imes and Hobbes Moore and all, these, and all of us good is that we're able to put things in categories. That has limited utility with humans. And ascription is what that is. Ascription is I decide who you are by your identity and not what you do. So I think that there is a double-edged sword. I think physicists have the tool set or the analytical prowess to address this in the right way. But we have to be able to get beyond our inclinations to classify things maybe uh, too early. Yeah, so I think I walked the line there. But yeah, it's, it's dangerous because it's very, I've had some very interesting discussions about how blacks or, or women or put, insert your identity and teaching them a certain way as though there's a black way of doing differential equation or there's a woman's way of doing lab experiments. Well, maybe, maybe, you know, it, 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 and we have to be able to make sure that we're, we're applying the right concepts to the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah well, some of the things you described, man, um, are there, yeah, are there any Did you ever get a chance to talk to Willie about what it was like to program the IBM 360? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, so that's a question for her daughter, who told me about how they'd have outings on the weekends at the, uh, <laughs> at the lab. And she and her brother thought they were picnics, but it turned out that she was programming the IBM 360. Um, no, no. Uh, I, I was, I wished, I, I think that's a subtext that I didn't get to. I, I, I didn't know that I was knowing her and her, her, uh, her um, last year of life. Right, and, and I, I, there are so many things that I, I've learned. So, so, so Dorian had the nerve to tell me that she learned so much about her mom from me, and I've learned so much about her mom from her. Um, but I wish that, I, I didn't even know about the 360 till I was reading a thesis. So I, I would have had no idea to ask you that. You know, so, no. Long-winded answer to say no. I, did, I don't, sadly. Right. Oh, is this a real question or one of those Roy Clark? <laughs> <laughs> so, your last but one slide is your portion of your family. Do you want to introduce the people who did that picture? I will introduce the ones I know, um, and then I'll ask someone who's in the picture to maybe give some insight on the other ones, the two. So, oh, am I not sharing anymore? 
think this thing just decided. Okay, there it is. So that's number 53. That's probably not the question you're asking. Um, so this is Willie in the front, her husband Sydney, Dorian, Christopher. Who are the other two women? That's good upbringing. I don't know anybody from sixth grade. <laughs> well, more importantly, they don't know me. You know. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And where were you guys going? Oh, uh, 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 duddy up. You remember? Well, you were there probably. This is probably where it is, wherever it is. Yeah. So, was that sixth grade for you? Was it sixth grade? I have to phone a friend, her, but I got an answer. <laughs> so, last chance. I got back up here. If I don't know the answers, I'll get, I can get them. All right. Thanks. Well, I want to thank you, Danelle, for a really wonderful talk. It was great to see all the uh, history and uh, putting things into context. So, thank you very much for. Okay. Coming all the way from California and uh, just arriving in Michigan winter. No. <laughs> 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 so, thank you. My pleasure. Well, let's give a big hand to. Uh,